Good evening, everyone. My name is Anakshi Sopti, and I'm the CEO of the Asia Society India Center. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our program today. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Asia Society is a leading educational organization dedicated to building awareness about art and culture, business, policy, technology, and education from across Asia on a global stage. At the India Center, our cultural programming is committed to recognizing and foregrounding the diversity of contemporary art, literature, museums and archives, and regional artistic traditions, not just from India, but from across South Asia. We have an exciting calendar of programs planned for the next few months, so keep following our website and social media handles to stay tuned. Today, I'm excited to launch our brand new initiative called Beyond the Ordinary Library Series with Asia Society, which aims to spotlight diverse literary voices and worlds from across South Asia. The first season of the series is developed in collaboration with HarperCollins and focuses on extraordinary non-fiction writing from India. I'm delighted to welcome journalist and author Pallavi Iyer, a good friend of ours at Asia Society, who's here to discuss her wonderful new book, Orienting, an Indian in Japan. The book is part travelogue, part memoir, part reportage, and is a sensitive portrait of her life and work in Japan. It's funny, endearing, enriching, and provides great insights into a people and culture that is both unique and idiosyncratic. In Pallavi's words, it's best to read it as a haiku, a subjective suggestion of a mood, a tantalizing glimpse, a truth, yes, but only one of many. Pallavi will be in conversation with Namita Devi Dial. Namita is a journalist with the Times of India and has authored three books, The Music Room, Aftertaste, and The Sixth String of Vilayat Khan. She's currently immersed in writing a web series set in Mumbai. Together, Pallavi and Namita will delve into the making of Pallavi's book and some of the ideas it uncovers. A tiny bit of housekeeping, we'll end the program with a Q&A session. However, do keep posting your questions in the Q&A tab through the program. For our audiences on Facebook, please drop your questions in the comments section. We'll try our best to get to each question, but in case we can't, I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in. And a very big thank you to HarperCollins for partnering with us on season one of our new series. Before I hand this over to Namita, a quick announcement. On October 8th, this Friday, we're celebrating 50 years of Mumbai's incredible Simrosa Art Gallery through a discussion on the role of private collections and their engagement with the public. Featuring Jay Levinson of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, poet and curator Ranjit Hoskote, gallerist Mortimer Chatterjee, and Joyati Roy from CSMVS in Mumbai. A link will be shared in the chat box. Do register and join us. And with that, Namita, over to you. Thank you, Inakshi. Pallavi, thank you for writing such a beautiful and insightful book about a country that um, has really sort of remained enigmatic and um, almost purposefully cryptic uh, for the outsider. Um, what I particularly like about the way you've written it is uh, that it's not attempting to be an authoritative book on Japan, but really something where you as a visitor, as a um, sort of temporary resident, have navigated this world and taken the reader with you um, and sort of like, really talked about the way in which you've been sometimes baffled and sometimes enchanted and sometimes even embraced some of these spaces and philosophies. Um, you know, I, I'd like to talk about some of the broad themes that, we've, uh, that you've written about. Um, I personally haven't been to Japan. So for me, it was just a wonderful little excursion. So, you know, for me, Japan has always been this blur of uh, origami and haiku poetry and uh, books by Pico Ayer, with whom you share a surname. <laughs> um, so it's been like a really special um, moment for me to sort of enter this space. I thought we could start by talking about, um, and I know I'm going to pronounce it wrong, um, Kintsugi. 
Um, spot on, spot on, Namita, in terms of the pronunciation. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to read out the paragraph describing what it is for those who don't know. I mean, it's something that sort of has sure. been very relevant in popular imagination and very sort of, um, it, it's been mainstreamized to some extent, but I want you to read that out. Um, I think it's on page 43. Right. And, um, you know, I, I think it's a very interesting concept, which we'll talk about a bit, um, because it, uh, especially in a time when social media sort of enables one to present an inauthentic but very perfect picture of oneself, Kim Sugi seems to, um, Kim Sugi seems to um, celebrate the opposite in a beautiful way. And, um, and what I was particularly moved by uh, was the fact that you talked about your own moment um, of feeling a bit broken and how you navigated that. So perhaps we could start by talking about you know, zooming out into the philosophy of um, Kim Sugi and then talking a little bit about how that may have changed and influenced you while you were there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for starting with that, because in many ways, that was my starting point into Japan as well. You know, when we uh, haven't like before I moved to Japan in 2016, I'd never visited it as a tourist. And uh, like most of us who haven't been to Japan, we have certain preconceptions um, of the country and to different people, it's different things. For some people, their in point is Japanese food. For some people, their in point is anime or manga. Uh, for me, it really was Kintsugi. It was something I'd heard of years before I actually moved to Japan. And it was the first topic uh, that I reported on, which I thought was very interesting in terms of what that revealed to me about how I approached Japan. Um, mm. There's a point in the book in which I look at the very first stories I reported on in China, the very first stories I reported on in Belgium, in Brussels, and then in Japan. And um, they were so different, you know, like in China, it was very political. I remember it was the SARS crisis of 2003. Um, and then when I was in uh, Brussels, it was about the Eurozone crisis. But here I was in Japan and the very first story I was looking at was a kind of archaic uh, pottery or ceramic repair technique. And that spoke somewhat to, I think, the sort of importance of the aesthetic and the aesthetic as philosophical um, in, in Japan. So very quickly, I'll read a couple of uh, bits from the book just to introduce the concept to people who might not be familiar yeah. with it. Um, and I sort of, uh, it's, uh, it begins in chapter two, which is uh, titled Breaking and Healing, uh, which is, I think, uh, something that is very aptly summed up uh, by uh, the craft of Kintsugi. Uh, and I begin, uh, it's actually on page 26, that I begin by quoting um, the 13th century Persian poet Rumi, uh, who said that the wound is the place where the light enters you. And, um, and that those were the words that were really uh, ringing in my head when I first came across the idea of Kintsugi, which was um, this art of repa repairing ceramics. And I first encountered it um, uh, through a meme um, that had been doing the rounds on social media, Facebook, uh, with the picture of this sort of gray ceramic bowl that was uh, rent by snaking golden tributaries running across it. And the words underneath it were Japanese repair broken pottery with powder gold lacquer to highlight imperfections, not to hide them. And as you also mentioned, at the time that I read it, I was in Indonesia and I had recently been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. And it had been a very terrifying experience for me because I was sort of battered by waves of really illogical uh, panic, uh, which uh, were terrifying because I couldn't understand why I was feeling like that rationally. And I remember thinking that this could be me forever. Um, and then gradually there was a process of, of, of healing. And ultimately, you know, um, I realized that um, 
uh, any kind of problems that we encounter in life end up being with us through that life. And they're not something just to kind of get through with and forget about, but there's something that accompany you and actually enhance you in many ways. They are your biography. They are what makes you you. And this was encapsulated again so beautifully in Kintsugi. So I'll now read that passage that you had asked me to on page 43, where I say, Kintsugi inscribes an object story into its body, the moment of the breakage, the fact that it was loved enough to be repaired, that it is likely to be handled with care in the future. For we have all been broken at some point, and the essence of who we are is not located in some flawless image that we might present, but along the fault lines of our biographies. Kintsugi encourage us to embrace our past along with its scars and to realize that our cracks make us even more beautiful. Thank you, Pallavi. You know, one of the things that struck me is that, um, and you know, you'll have to correct me because I've clearly not um, been able to figure this paradox out, which is that on one level, philosophically in Japan, there seems to be this embracing of imperfection, this idea of being able to uh, be comfortable with the scarring and with the sort of like flaws and, um, you know, on a philosophical and aesthetic level. And yet there's a kind of a tremendous, um, almost opaque quality to the way in which people deal with themselves and their lives and their expressions uh, and that's something that I couldn't quite kind of like um, figure out because it's it's a um, it, it's almost as if the philosophy doesn't allow the individual to really be as expressive as they might want to be or they are in a western society uh, you know there's a kind of an absolutely muted quality which is also very lovely by the way I'm not even um, judging it I think it's kind of incredible to be um, celebrating silence and finding communication in silence because it's something we all have really moved away from. But that is something which I wasn't able to fully understand. If you, you know, you know, Namita, you probably can't fully understand it. Most Japanese people probably can't fully understand it. And I'm not sort of laying claims to having understood it either. I think the fact is that you will find a lot that is contradictory in most societies and Japan is no exception. And I think I'm quite comfortable with that, with that sort of possibility of contradictions and the possibility of even contradictory facts both holding true so that you can have deeply empathetic, but at the same time, deeply reserved characters characteristics in Japanese society. And I think I mentioned somewhere about how I thought Japan was both profoundly healing and it was devastatingly broken. I mean, on the one hand, we're talking about uh, Kintsugi and, 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 and how it represents this wonderful acceptance of uh, the scars that we all have, and it can be such a profoundly healing philosophy. On the other hand, we all do know that Japan suffers from some of the highest rates of suicides in the world, that it has an entire group of people called hikikimori who are these social recluses numbering upwards of a million people who essentially lock themselves up in their homes and issue all kinds of social co uh, contact um you know it, i was uh, amazed at the number of um writers um in japan being a writer myself who had ended their lives uh, in suicide uh, i mean writer after writer <laughs> You talk about uh, you know, Nishima, right? What is yes, Nishima killed himself, Kawabata. I mean, it's, 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 it's uh, you know, the Dazai. There's a very, very high percentage of, uh, of, of writers who have killed themselves. And suicide, in fact, has a kind of traditional cachet. It was a way of, uh, you, you know, if, if, if somebody felt that they had done anything dishonorable, then the only way to kind of uh, uh, exonerate yourself was really by killing yourself. And there was ritual... Uh, uh, disembowelment, uh, uh, you know, seppuku, um, uh, which has been very much part of um, Japanese uh, traditional culture as well. So you do have these contradictory facets, contradictory flows. Um, and, um, and, and I think that that's, as I said, I think it's okay. We don't necessarily need to resolve 
those contradictions oh. neatly because they don't need to be resolved neatly this is i mean life is messy truth is really singular and it's almost always chaotic and messy and it's something i've realized um living in all the different countries i have that in almost every country that i've lived in from india to indonesia to china whatever you say about the country the opposite can also hold true of it um so uh so yeah i think it's more interesting really just to follow these threads rather Other than to try to resolve them neatly. Oh, sure. And you know, connected to this idea as well is um, this incredible idea about silence, um, which again has so many layers to it because um, it reflects in. I mean, you talk about how even uh, silence reflects in the idea of of no taste of of uh, you know the fact that like a sake drink. um is is actually fairly tasteless compared with say a cabernet or, or any other wine and yeah uh, yet so potent and that's almost a metaphor for uh, the society where um you know the non communication silence and the pauses are um sort of treated with so much um i mean given so much value uh and i i have to read out this paragraph because it amused me so much um and Please. the fact that we're able to find so much humor in things that are so kind of bizarre and dark almost is really amazing um so this is really about how um so you talk about silences which inhabited much social behavior in japan at the end of my weekly yoga class for example run of the mill chatter about weekend plans or netflix series was glaringly absent instead students spent several minutes painstakingly wiping their yoga mats clean for subsequent use by others in silence at restaurants it was not unusual to see groups of friends sitting together and eating silently save for the slurp of noodles and splash of soup and this one really got me i once saw a toddler fall off a swing at a public park and scream silently <laughs> He screwed up his eyes and pulled back his lips into a grimace, but not a sound came out of his mouth. This is just unbelievable and also kind of terrifying, right? Because it's it's the beginnings of what one sees as I'm sorry, I'm going to use the word, but an enormously repressed um, society where even a toddler is not giving way to what is the most natural thing, which happens at the time of childbirth, right? Which is a scream. um it's the next thing after breath really you know so this idea of silence and um so so maybe you can again talk about that and all yes. these things aesthetically and philosophically and in the communal setting and then also how you who really i mean are such a chattery and incredibly articulate and garrulous person had to deal with that i mean there's this lovely bit in in, in which people say uh, somebody says to you that they're more concerned about how um you will be silent in all of this so so yes, I, i i think you're referring to the part of when i started taking japanese classes uh, in preparation for moving to tokyo and i was discovering how complicated right. it was grammatically and i was complaining to a japanese friend of mine and saying oh it's so difficult and you know all the verbs and the conjugations and the hierarchy and how am i ever going to learn to speak japanese and she looked at me and said pallavi i think for you the problem is not going to be learning how to speak japanese but learning how to speak quietly and that did sort of sum up my experience i was uh, uh yelled at quite regularly or at least given dark looks quite frequently over the four years that i lived there for speaking much and speaking loudly as uh, a garrulous indian uh, with verbal diarrhea is uh, wont to do and indeed it was difficult initially for me to get used to uh, japanese social norms which tend to um, feature silence a lot more than they do in for example indian society or spanish society since i'm in spain right now and you know i think we are kind of conditioned to think of pauses and of silence as 
something that's negative um, as a kind of a demonstration that the other person, if they are being silent, is not interested in what you have to say or is finding what you are saying boring and we kind of rush to fill in the gaps which we tend to perceive as awkward. And it took me a while really to figure out that the silences in Japan were really often not hostile and that by Japanese people themselves, they were not perceived as something that was necessarily problematic. Um, often it was just listening fully. Um, and, you know, I, I think it sort of helps you to realize that sometimes what needs to be said is maybe not best expressed in words but just expressed by presence um, occasionally. You know, you can sit with somebody and be companionable and have a meal at a restaurant. And, you know, if there isn't anything all that pressing to talk about, that doesn't matter. You are still expressing a certain uh, relationship of camaraderie uh, with the other person. Um, you know, the philosophical ramifications, we can philosophize and theorize about why this might be the case and bring it back as almost all things I think all roads in Japan lead to Zen Buddhism at some yeah. level, which is really so foundational um, to the culture, to the aesthetics, to the philosophy. And, you know, in Zen, ultimately, there is a distrust of words. Um, you are not supposed to be able to gain enlightenment by learning or reading. And the whole point of Zen koans or those little parables in which a disciple usually asks a Zen master how to gain enlightenment. And then the Zen master does something like, instead of answering the question, slap the disciple or bang his staff, but basically reply in a way that is without words because it's trying yeah. to indicate to the disciple that they are asking the wrong questions, sure. that this is something that you have to instinctively connect with and that words are actually distracting from the essential truth that you might be on the path to uh, discover or is your ultimate goal um, to discover. So there is that. But then another thing, is that I don't want to overemphasize the silence either because, you know, just like in every country, you will find Japanese people who are very talkative and more talkative than the norm. And I don't want to kind of fall into this trap of cultural essentialism. Um, I think um, Japanese often are obviously going to be more silent when talking to a foreigner like me because my Japanese was terrible. And so they had to speak in English. It is possible that when they are speaking in a language that they are more comfortable with, um, they display a greater range of um, you know desire to talk some people will talk a lot some people will talk less and so on there are also class elements to this and you know you do find people in the countryside you do find people who are sort of lower down on the socioeconomic scale working class people tend to be more talkative tend to be louder in general the, the kind of silence is also refined it's considered to be refined and it's you know also a kind of snobbery that you that you will find amongst the more educated classes in the metropolitan cities there are are also regional differences. I mean, in Japan, the stereotype is of citizens of the city of Osaka are supposed to be huge chatterboxes. Um, and, you know, Osakans think that people from Tokyo are very taciturn and, and don't talk much. So, you know, there are those differences as well. Um, so, I mean, what I mean is that if I were to make a generalization, certainly Japanese society, I think, is more comfortable with absence and with silence. And you see that in its philosophy, you see that in its architecture, you see that in its aesthetics. You see that, as you pointed out, in wine. If I may quote um, the, 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 the writer who said this about sake, he said that the most elegant Japanese sake are defined by the absence of taste, the reverse of what one looks for in wine. For sake is about what's not there. With wines, it's about what is there. It's like in speech. The pauses and the silences, the things that aren't there, give a hint of the meaning. The most elegant sakes are barely there at all. They taste almost like water. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a uh, there's certainly like I mean, uh, uh, with the caveat of this sounding a bit like cultural essentialism, it is a society that tends to. Uh, gravitate towards silence and that's partly also because it tends to gravitate towards uh, emotional makeup which is about suppression and um, I think that the reason for that is that 
they have an extremely heightened sense of public sense of public sensitivity and civic consciousness and the idea that you as a person do not want to impose on either the oral landscape of that around you on the personal space of others and that you know whether it is by the sort of toddler that's suppressing his scream or the person who's not expressing their emotions at a funeral um you know there is a valorization of the idea that you carry that within you so as not to be a burden on the community on the whole so there is a suppression of the individual supposedly in pursuit of uh benefiting um the community um um and and so if there was a cultural value i think you could say that that was a cultural value in japan which has its positive and negative ramifications and and i think um i think we all have to remind ourselves that our idea of silence um is actually a little deceptive because um silence encompasses a lot of things it, it encompasses music and and breath and the sound of um you know air and breeze and i think that that's namita you know what else which we never think of is architecture and i think that that's yeah. something that um i also felt very deeply in japanese architecture that they often have <laughs> alcove shadows and spaces which have depth but which are empty of uh, of baroque decoration it's kind of the opposite of say french rococo you know it's about taking away taking away taking away and leaving just the bare essence often um uh, to really let the space speak and so you get this wonderful contradiction of in some ways when you have some silence when you have some silence for the ears when you have some silence for the eyes is when you can truly hear spaces that the voice of spaces as it were and and in fact um somebody once described architecture as frozen music so that kind of really lends itself to the idea that there is so much within the silence right um and in fact i'm going to take this opportunity to read out this haiku by uh, that you have quoted here um by master koba yashi isa my favorite mosquito at my ear does he think i'm dead so isn't idea, that wonderful it's also so clever and funny and uh, just all of it and also it's such a kind of a tribute to uh to nature which is seemingly silent but in fact has incredible sound and of teeming yeah. i would say orchestra of sound in it right so it's really basically taking um the chatter out of life or rather yeah and and sort of like paying attention to what what we termed as silence but is in fact not i'm i'm also now just going to take a minute to look at some of the questions that are popping up there are quite a few just for just for a break and um I think this fits into um I I I a conversation about silence because somebody Mudit Jain has asked us uh what is the significance of water stones and carp fish in a Japanese temple Yeah again I'm not sure that I'm really the right person to to address that <laughs> you'd need somebody who has kind of studied um the architectural representation of zen buddhism more there's the there's always this raked um, they have pebbles and then they rake them and they leave different kinds of patterns which are like stone paintings or gravel paintings as it were and it's like little ripples going off in the mind and extremely meditative and once again you have very sort of it's very simple and out of the most simple things like just pebbles that are raked in different patterns if you sort of sit there and meditate upon them you're supposed to be able to find the true nature of the universe sure. um but i mean i think what's interesting is the connection that you also referred to earlier about nature and the japanese because that is something that they very strongly sort of self identify with as well and it's interesting to me namita because um 
Japan has been orientalized and romanticized uh, for a very long time uh, by the West. And, you know, most writers, Western writers or foreign writers on Japan have tended to focus on the kind of aesthetic uh, aspects of Japan. So it's one of the most aestheticized countries, I think, in the world. Like I was saying earlier, people will write about Chinese politics, but they will write about Japanese aesthetics, um, which, uh, I, you know, I, which is interesting. Uh, and I think that to some extent, the Japanese have almost self-internalized that description of themselves as an aesthetic people. Um, and there are reasons, there are multiple reasons why they might have done so. You know, as nations, we all search for sources of identity. Uh, what is it that makes us tick? What is it that makes us unique? Was What is it that makes us us? And I think for many Asian countries um, in the 20th century, um, um, the answer was really a kind of uh, nationalism that was born out of the colonial experience, right? Um, uh, which kind of gave us a sense of who we are in the modern world. And it was, uh, so for example, for China, it, that was kicked off with the opium wars. For India, it was British colonialism. For Indonesia, it was Dutch colonialism. And then the national movement uh, movements and the independence movements that helped us to forge a new modern consciousness about who we were as a people. And this whole process was more complicated for Japan and the Japanese because they were not colonized. They had in fact been um, the colonizers. Um, they had not been aggressed upon rather than been the aggressors. Now, not all Japanese agree with this and you have, uh, you know, uh, certainly you do have nationalistic strains within um, Japanese uh, society and politics, but it is difficult for them to uh, use nationalism as the basis for their source of identity because it's, uh, it's too wound up negatively with what went down in the Second World War. So I think that in some ways, and this is really my theory, it could be bogus, yeah. but my feeling is that uh, nature provides quite a, a, a neutral uh, sort of source uh, for this search for identity, for what makes us as a people really us. And so there is a great stress in Japan by Japanese writers, by ordinary Japanese people about their supposedly very special relationship with Japan, now uh, with nature. Now this plays out um, in many ways uh, and it sort of almost seems uh, like it's internalized to the extent that it's become a fact. I don't think that Japanese like are genetically more predisposed towards loving nature than any other human beings on this earth. But because it is something that's valorized so much in their literature, in their sort of self-exploration, it becomes fact. Um, there's no other country that I have seen people, for example, regard flowers and trees with uh, as much veneration as I have seen in Japan. There would be cues, there would be scrums of people trying to take a photograph of a single blossoming tree in Tokyo in spring, uh, you know, the kinds of crowds uh, the kind of scrum that in India you would only get with Bollywood stars or cricket stars. And here it would be a tree. I mean, these were the great celebrities um, of Japan. Um, Can you I know, the fun doubt a yes. while you talk about nature and please uh, Japan, because this is so beautiful. Um, and this one's from Isa. In September, the sky wears a lined kimono. That is just so evocative. It is. It um, is. And I and I and because I have an entire chapter on the four seasons, because I believe yes. that the Japanese themselves feel that the seasons are very important to their sense of self. I do quote um, um, haiku that illustrate each yeah, of those seasons. So in the summer, it's the insects. Right, so you have the cicadas, and you have the mosquito, the one that you read out earlier, um, and then in the spring you usually have the frog. Um, in the winter you'll have beautiful imagery of, of snow and so on. Um, you know, and the and the sort of uh, emotions that are related to each of the seasons, the melancholy of autumn, which is at the same time. Um, it's not really sad. It's it's both natural but also melancholic. And winter is never terrible either because it always anticipates spring. Um, so yeah, there's something quite amazing about it. And you know, with the the clothes, um, 
the motifs of the season. Uh, restaurants change their menu every season. Ice cream flavors change. In the autumn, you always get chestnut ice cream. In the spring, you always get um, Sakura. Cherry blossom ice cream, sakura ice cream. So, you know, the flower arrangements, uh, the fact that tea ceremony, which is so seminal to Japanese philosophy, will always, uh, the, the decoration of the of the tea room changes according to the season, that the conversation I that you have with each other has to make seasonal references. Um, uh, yeah. How, there, are, there are 72 micro seasons, which is kind of extraordinary, right? Because it's really paying attention to the, the micro changes in nature that then in, that in, you know in, then impact our our lives. And I've, I've noticed that even in India, which follows the lunar almanac, there is this kind of like very close connect with tides and the moon and nature and, and festivals and uh, food patterns, and it's all very interconnected. So I found that very special and beautiful that the fact that it's still so um, prevalent in the contemporary. Uh, culture of the country you know it's not just relegated That's right. to village life and you talk about for example you've given a random sampling of some of these seasons which are so sweetly described so in October you have the season called I'm not going to say it in Japanese in English it's wild geese return in November you have camellias bloom and then rainbows hide and in January you have wheat sprouts under snow and then later ice thickens on streams, which is so, it's so perceptive and sort of palpable and possibly does give people cues to behavior as well, which is still alive, right? Like they, they still probably, as you said, you know, follow food patterns and um, maybe even clothing based on these micro seasons, which is incredible. Um, Absolutely. And I think that, you know, this was probably uh, true for many countries that people lived close to nature. And it's something that got lost in many other cultures and societies. I mean, a lot of this comes from China. The 72 micro seasons, for example, was something that also existed in China. But China went through all these upheavals and social changes, I mean, including the communist revolution, the cultural revolution, and so on, which have caused a disjuncture between its traditions, its history, and its uh, and its present. So that's something that didn't happen in Japan because it was not disrupted by revolutions. It was not disrupted by colonialism. I think it does have a stronger connect to its own history than many other countries. And then, as I said, I do think that there's this, this, this the fact that nature is a very neutral source of identity which uh, so that when people were casting about for what is it that makes the Japanese Japanese, it had an appeal. So we saw so much writing. There's this entire writing um, uh, genre of writing called Nihon Jinron, uh, which was basically a 20th century genre in which Japanese writers tried to explain Japan to Japanese. Um, and um, they you did so. To talk a bit about Nihon Jinron because I, I found it very interesting because you kind of encapsulated a lot about what what it um, see, uh, seeks to represent Japan as, you know, whether or not it's accurate, it's a certain self um, analysis, really, right? Correct. So, um, it I tends to be self valorizing, though, um, perhaps that's naturally. Fine. That's really and it tends to sometimes be really exaggerated. I mean, there was one doctor who's quite a famous uh, exponent of Nihon Jinron who claims that the Japanese brain is just different to everybody else's brain because it's more left-sided than right-sided so that the Japanese actually hear the chirping of cicadas in a different, more emotive way than other normal people do. And again, I'm not sure about the scientific basis for all of this, but I think I joke in the book that after having spent four years in Japan and just being so much more attuned to the chirping of cicadas than I would be in any other country, <laughs> simply because people talked about it so much more that perhaps they do <laughs> hear the cicadas differently. I'm not sure. Well, you, you basically say here that uh, when, when they talk about Nihon Jinron, um, the tropes included an ostensible Japanese propensity to collectivism, mm. in which clearly defined boundaries between the self and others were ambiguous, the salience of nonverbal communication, and an exceptional relationship with nature. So these are these do seem to be reflective in the 
um, you know, the society and, and li- daily living in, in Japan, right? Like you talk about that. It's a bit of a chicken and egg thing, Namita. They probably already existed as propensities. They are then sort of internalized and valorized and taught as Japanese values. Then you begin to understand yourself in those terms. And then perhaps those aspects become more exaggerated than they would have been if other aspects had been picked up on. As we sp- spoke earlier, there is also a tendency to ritual suicide and uh, and uh, social anomie and so on. But, you know, the Nihon Jinron tropes do not necessarily include that so it depends on you know which tropes you end up selecting uh, and they they kind of self-selected and I also think that they are selected a little bit from the orientalists I do like I was saying earlier this whole tendency to romanticize and orientalize Japan by the way the title of the book is a kind of nod in that direction as well orienting um, that uh, uh, I think is something that was then almost uh, taken up by some of these Nihon Jinron writers and uh, so that they, it led to a sort of self-essentialization. Uh, so it's quite complicated and you know as with all oh. cultures and societies it's sort of difficult to know uh, what is true or what becomes true simply because enough people believe it. In fact uh, we have a question that's just popped up by Radhika which says that um, Japanese exceptionalism was a big driver of the said nationalism. So how much of it do you think still exists? Japanese exceptionalism, I think a lot of it still exists. I think the Japanese uh, feel uh, on the whole, again, so caveat, caveat, these are generalizations. I'm sure there are exceptions. Um, but I think the Japanese uh, feel on the whole that they are different. Um, partly, I think it's an island mentality. They are an archipelago. And in most uh, um, archipelagos or island nations, you have a sense of um, being exceptional because you are not, you do not have immediate neighbors. Uh, you are separated. Uh, from your neighbors by vast bodies of water um, and uh, so and they also have a sense of homogeneity which again can be a little bit disingenuous and we can talk about that but compared to many other countries they do not have the diversity the linguistic ethnic uh, religious diversity that many other Asian countries say Indonesia India China just to name a few have Um, And they have never been uh, in modern times, at least open and in uh, early modern times as well. For a long time, they were closed to all outside contacts. There was a 200 period of uh, 200 year period of isolation where foreigners were not allowed in at all. And in the modern avatar of that, they are very anti-immigration compared to all other OECD developed economies and developed countries. They accept an abysmally low number of asylum seekers, for example. On average, I think it's something like between 10 and 15 people are taken in every year on political asylum, which is a fraction of what you would find, say, for example, in most European countries, which populations that are much smaller than Japan's. And it's also notoriously immigration averse on the economic front, uh, despite the fact that it has an aging demographic, despite the fact that its economy has been sort of stagnant and in a holding pattern for several decades now, and that the solution, according to many economists, is to open up. But there is a hesitance to do this because there is a feeling that all that makes Japan special, that makes Japan itself, would get diluted by letting people from outside come in. Um, And uh, so, you know, I think that sense of exceptionalism continues to be strong and continues to be a political force um, uh, in the country. Pallavi, I'm going to take this very interesting question from somebody um, who I think is Japanese, Mr. Taniguchi, um, who says, um, thank you for a fascinating discussion. Did you get struck by the fact that at many Buddhist temples in Japan, one sees a huge number of Hindu gods being worshipped. How did you connect the two seemingly different cultures that do nonetheless share spiritual commonalities? Interesting. Because you do talk Very about interesting. That. And again, I talk about this in uh, quite yeah. a lot of detail in the book where I talk about the, 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 the way in which Hindu deities were absorbed into the Japanese Buddhist uh, pantheon. Um, uh, and the kind of journey that they made, which was mediated via China uh, before uh, they ultimately made it to Japan. And this journey is often obfuscated. You know, most Japanese people themselves are not aware of the 
Indic origins of a lot of these uh, deities. And indeed, for an Indian, sometimes they can also do, they don't look uh, physically like we are used to the representations of our own deities. Often what ends up happening is that the, the, the Hindu deities uh, become transformed into um, guardian spirits in Japanese Buddhism. So you'll see them at the entryways to Japanese Buddhist temples as protectors uh, to kind of keep evil spirits away. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, they're normally known as Ten, uh, which is a word in, 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 in Hindi or in Sanskrit it would translate as Deva, but in Japanese it's Ten. And there's a whole range of these Deva slash Tens that are basically representations from Indra to Varuna to Garuda to... Um, to Brahma, you name it, Saraswati, Lakshmi, you have all of these um, deities in some way or the other uh, that exist um, within uh, the Japanese uh, Buddhist world. Um, and I have a, a story, I have a, a quite a detailed story of the Ganesha temple in Tokyo, um, yeah. which is one of the oldest Ganesha temples outside of India, anywhere in the world. And yeah. it was uh, very interesting to go and visit it because um, the transformations I mean, the Ganesha in Japan, Kangi Ten, it's known as Kangi Ten, also sometimes Binayaka, more obviously Sanskrit. Um, uh, so Kangi Ten has been, is a very different creature in Japan to the Ganesha that we are used to. The Ganesha we are used to is sort of portly and fat and jovial and has ladoos and sits on a rat. Um, the Ganesha in, um, in Japan, Kangi Ten, is not a holy positive spirit he can be quite angry he can create a lot of obstacles in the ways of people and so has to kind of be propitiated in order not to create the obstacles in order to remove i mean we have that the removal of obstacles is there within the indic tradition as well but what's interesting is that the ganesha in japan doesn't like to eat ladu he likes to eat daikon which is a kind of white mooly it's a radish and so all over the ganesha temple in tokyo you will see the daikon in image and people buy daikon and like chadhao it like they would in an arti or it's in a puja it's it's quite, but that's a lot about japan which feels very um resonant for an indian but at the same time completely like alien you have that sense of both it's 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 familiar but off kilter you know yeah. uh, uh uh and and i felt that like very strong that there was things that i recognized but oh. then they would confuse me uh yeah, so yeah, there was simultaneously book for sure yeah simultaneously oh. confusion and uh, recognition similarity yeah. and affinity but also a feeling of you know great disjuncture and incomprehensibility and yeah. again these existed almost hand in hand and i think they have to do with our common uh, buddhist heritage uh, uh, at least the resonance and the similarity but then of course the differences are in how um, that story uh, changed and uh, over time and over space Pallavi, um, there's a question that is, I'm biased because I'd like you to talk about it as well, which is uh, from Gita Choksi, where uh, she says, would you please speak a bit on how the Japanese almost venerate autumn? Yes. So I, to be fair, I think the Japanese tend to venerate the four seasons. OK, and I'm not sure that everybody would choose autumn over every other season. Uh, for many people, spring is their favorite. The summer is evisceratingly hot so, and full of mosquitoes and cicadas. So it's harder to like as your favorite season. But it does have uh, fireflies um, and that can be extremely magical. And fireflies are deeply associated with uh, with the summer. I think people like the autumn because uh, it's sort of uh, like in India, you know, when you have the extreme heat of the summer, and then you have the monsoon, the first rains, which bring down the temperature. Similarly, autumn is kind of a, a crispening of, uh, of the weather, which makes you physically more comfortable. But it is also spectacular spectacularly beautiful. I mean, Japan is in a, in a zone um, uh, in which the leaves really turn um, golden, yellow, red, and it looks like, um, you know, it looks as though the almighty, whoever that might be, is a painter and has descended on earth and is, you know, 
painting this most dramatic and beautiful canvas uh, for all of us to gorge and feast our eyes upon. Um, there's also the mid-autumn uh, moon festival, which is, again, it comes from China originally. Um, and then I think it's a, a time that has inspired a lot of the poets. I mean, I think most Can of I the... You, you, you can, but I remember reading somewhere that something like, uh, and this would prove the point of the person who asked the question, that I think something like four times as many haiku uh, are, are situated in autumn than in any other season. But please, please go ahead and read some. Bashu, right. Bashu who was considered the master of the autumn verse, capturing its pathos and pulchritude with gnomic perfection. And I write. And I read, with what kind of voice would the spider cry in the autumn wind? And I go and you remain two autumns. Oh, that's my favorite. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. So I think it's also that spirit of melancholy. And that spirit of melancholy does imbue so much that is in Japanese philosophy. I mean, there is the, the most famous uh, of these philosophical concepts would probably be mono no avare, which is the pain or the melancholy of things being finite, the pain or the melancholy, but also the appreciation of the passing of things. And it's encapsulated in the cherry blossom, in the sakura bloom, because it is so exquisite, but it is so short. Within two weeks, the blossoms are gone. That's what actually creates that appreciation of the beauty that it was there at all. And while you are seeing it, you know that it is fleeting, that you will not maybe see it tomorrow. And that's what actually adds to your appreciation of that moment. So I think that sort of sense of melancholy uh, in the passing of things um, is quite integral to Japanese philosophy. It comes out especially, I think, in the transitional seasons of spring and autumn. Um, Pallavi, we have a question. We have tons of questions, so I'm going to actually address some of them because um, we only have... We uh, only have about 10 minutes left, yes. Yeah. So Nasreen Rustamfram is asking, how do women in Japan straddle the world of work and domestic duties? Which, I, I mean, I'm intrigued to know only because there is a very, it's a very traditional and yet very strangely modern society, right? So be interesting to hear. No, you. I think that this is a very pertinent question and it's a question I get asked a lot and it's a question I've thought about a lot. Now, you know, out of most OECD countries, uh, I think Japan performs quite badly on a lot of parameters of gender empowerment. However, it's not as bad as you, as you might think. I mean, I often find people from India asking me about poor Japanese women and I find that a bit rich because, you know, Japanese women inhabit public space with confidence. There's like low crime against women and if you look at the uh, labor force participation of Japanese women it's at about 70 percent plus of working age women are in the labor force which is higher than the world average it is higher I think than the U.S. in India the the matching number is something like 28 or 29 percent the problem that we have is that you have most Japanese women in part-time and in menial positions it becomes harder and harder for them to work their way up uh, particularly corporate ladders, and there's a definite glass ceiling. Also in politics, the representation of women is abysmally low, and it's lower, for example, I think, than in India, uh, in, 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 in some cases at least. Um, I have a section in the book in which I pose the whole question of gender as, would I rather, if I could choose, would I rather be a Japanese man or would I rather be a Japanese woman? <laughs> and uh, the answer that I pick is I would rather be a Japanese woman. Now, this goes against the idea that this is a deeply patriarchal but society. This is gender fluid, remember that. Yes, yes. But that's a whole other, that's a whole other discussion. Namita. So let's limit, Namita, so we limit this right now. So, um, uh, so, you know, I think it goes against the whole idea of uh, that Jap Japan is this deeply patriarchal society where women are oppressed. Why would I choose to be a Japanese woman? rather than a Japanese man, given this common conception. And I actually think that the biggest problem that Japan faces uh, for gender and for culture and society in general is its culture of work, its culture of overwork. 
and the fact that essentially it becomes impossible to have a job in Japan and have any kind of work life balance and this mm. is punishing for men it is punishing for women it makes it very difficult uh, for both men and women to work which is why you often end up having a situation where after women have children they stop working because it is not a work system that is allowed uh, that allows or facilitates any kind of balance but the japanese man the average salary man uh, you know who's working 12 hour days and is essentially a slave to their boss has to go on these alcohol fueled evenings out whether they like it or not often misses the last train back home doesn't see their family for days on end and spends the weekends being how you talked about how they have to be apologetic if they're the first person to leave the office right is- so it's built it's built into the language itself you don't just say adios or ciao or see you tomorrow you apologize for going before your colleagues every time you leave so there's this great um, uh, sort of inbuilt pressure to stay and stay and stay in the office to kind of show your dedication uh regardless of whether it's actually helping productivity or the work itself and you know japan is one of the only countries in the world that actually has a word for death by overwork uh which is karoshi oh, and it has um you know several dozen cases every year of people just either dropping dead on their desks because of the amount of overtime that they've been putting in or dying of hypertension or um, heart attacks that have been linked to overwork this is there's actually commissions that have been instituted to investigate this and you know they tried to put a policy in of casual friday where people would go home early on friday it did not work people are it's so ingrained this kind of crazy office culture uh that it's very hard uh, for japanese to change that but i think it would make it would solve a lot of problems it would make for a happier society it would make for a society in which women and men can have more full lives uh and sort of you know fully explore uh full um, all the aspects of what it means to be human uh which tends to be both a sort of public work related aspect and an aspect that's more private and has to do with home and family life palavi since we're running out of time i'm going to run through a couple more questions because they're really interesting um yes so what this one actually is um is is not specific to japan but it's about you as a travel as a writer of um books that are uh, that traverse all these different countries that you um spend time in so uh this is an anonymous attendee uh when you move to a new country uh do you consciously start thinking of a book and if yes do you think that colors your experience somewhat and i have a corollary to that question actually palavi which is that um uh i mean h- how do you find yourself Uh, relating and writing about these um cultures uh and and in some ways uh well yeah if you can answer that actually so no whenever i mean the simple answer is that i have never gone to a country thinking i'm going to write that country um and i do think that i almost consciously don't think that because it would um put blinkers on me to a certain extent it would uh maybe uh persuade me to walk down certain roads and not other roads so i kind of almost i'm always deliberately open um initially and people always say oh so you'll be writing a book or what's your next project i don't have one i kind of let everything wash over me particularly for the first couple of years and mm-hmm. as a kind of practice peripatetic if i might phrase it like that you know i know that there's a kind of rhythm to this constant moving and at least the first year is the year where you are the most attuned to everything around you it's a very sensory experience where your eyes see more than normal your ears hear more than normal um you know you smell more than normal you're very acutely aware of your surroundings before they kind of become mundane opaque and normalized as they do um and so for example i actually read all the signs on billboards when i see somebody reading a book i notice what's the title of the book i try i when people talk to each other i either overhear the conversation if i don't understand the language i look at the body language whether they are holding their hand over their mouth when they laugh whether they are leaning into each other or kind of tend to keep a distance 
all of it, you know, you, you notice, you notice, you notice, and there's so many things that are of interest. And eventually it's like a sediment pro uh, process, you know, some of the sediment settles down and you start seeing patterns and you start seeing what it is about this place that interests you. Because ultimately when I write about a place, it's not because I want to write a book and, you know, it, it, I don't see it as work. I see it as something that's fascinating. And I want to be fascinated by it because only then do I think I can make it fascinating for others, for readers. Um, and then the other thing, um, Namita, is that I'm also a journalist. So in all of these countries, I have also functioned as a reporter and have done like weekly stories on things, on, on culture, on the economy, on politics. And at the end of three or four years, you've ended up meeting all kinds of interesting people, ask them lots of interesting questions. And you've got these reporters' notebooks that are chock-a-block with facts and observations and analysis that didn't actually make it into your final newspaper reports. And you see these kinds of patterns emerging, which can then help you to possibly write a book. And I also try to write these from a comparative angle. So when I'm writing about Japan, it's not really just writing about Japan. It's about writing about Japan as an Indian who knows China. So, you know, I'm kind of bringing uh, mm. um, echoes and echoes and different, the kind of multiple lenses that I have acquired uh, through my professional life over the world. Uh, I try to sort of bring those to the fore as well, because nowhere is in itself anything it's 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 the lens that you that you train on it that gives it meaning and i think the more multiple lenses i acquire the more multiple and different perspectives that i gather on the same phenomenon and i find that personally very enriching and interesting uh, yeah um you know i i i wonder you know which of the countries uh, you found, I guess it, it was my really my last question because I think now we've um, pushed time quite a bit, but um, what would you say is the one most abiding and beloved thing you took away from Japan um, if you were to sort of look at um, any one thing? Yeah. I think it's a concern for others. Mm. I think it's something that we could really learn from in our own civic culture in India, which yeah. is really lacking, you know, this idea that your behavior, your actions, your voice, your littering um, uh, impacts on those around you. That the idea that, that, we, that we have a civic space and the kind of normalization of civic behavior, or you, and, and that's really lacking in many developing countries, India included. And I think it's something that Japan has perfected to an art. It's something that makes it very special. It is incredible. It's the idea that good breeds good. And as you put Correct. it, if, if you find somebody else's valuables and return them to the police, it's very likely that the same will happen to you. Yes, you pass it on, you pass it on. And I think and that, you know, this is something that a lot of Japanese people are acculturated to in their families and definitely at schools uh, from a very young age, yeah. uh, which, uh, which is really something quite tremendous and to be learned from. And, and I think uh, you also talk about what a privilege it is that children can... Uh, board um, metros at, even at the age of six alone. Um, yes. I think that would be unheard of in many parts of. It North sounds America. like a fairy tale. I think in many other parts of the. <laughs> yeah. So so it's a very it's a very exceptional thing. So it's a yeah. Um, I, I have so many questions that I'm going to just take one or two. Perhaps more. one last one. Uh, one last. Namita. Yeah. Um. Are there any Japanese writers that are your favorites? Hmm. Many. I like Kanazaki very much. Um, Kanazaki uh, has a uh, very well-known Japanese writer. And what I, I particularly love the Makioka Sisters, which I think is, um, it's essentially like, you could say that um, Kanazaki was like Japan's Jane Austen. Or you might say that Jane Austen was, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the English version of, of Tanazaki. It's a wonderful book um, that's set amongst a family with three daughters and has a lot to do with their marriages, their prospects, their romances. It's set uh, in the uh, early part and the middle part of the 20th century and fantastic panoramic uh, view um, into Japanese society. So, uh, yeah. I, I would pick uh, Tanazaki and in particular the Makioka sisters. 
Pallavi, I think we, I mean, there's just so much more interest, but we've run out of time. So yeah. thank you so much. This has just been so lovely. Fantastic and, for me. And thank you for your considerate and considerate question. Book because I find it so fun and, and also it reflects Pallavi and her humor and Japan all in one. And of course, the cherry blossoms. Um, I recommend this book and um, I'd like to thank all of you for attending and especially to Asia Society for hosting this, the first of what promises to be a lovely literary series. So thank you all.